Um, yesterday, after Dror's very elegant talk, I got asked what is PEG. So I went back to my room and replaced uh, half of the slides from the chemistry and the molecular biology side to a more schematic slide. So maybe it will be a little bit longer, but hopefully it will at least be understandable to some of you, and I won't get these glazed looks of uh, what are you talking about. So, whoops, it's not working. So I'll start with some very interesting uh, commentary that Helmut Ringsdorf, a famous polymer chemist, wrote in Angevante Chemie back in 1988 talking about tradition and innovation in science, where tradition is the basis for it represents the accumulation of wisdom in the body of knowledge, and innovation is the adventure, because with challenges come the risk of calling into question or even losing one's own scientific identity, which has been gained through tradition. And he summarizes that tradition uh, and solid work are honored and admired. Nevertheless, science can be justified only by challenge and demands the willingness to give up long-held classical or traditional views in an attempt to discover new horizons. So I will show you some of, like PEG, some of the old polymers, polymers and what new tricks we can do with them without losing the, the old and classic polymer chemistry here. So I think two, three years ago, I, we just started this uh, project of tumor dormancy and I gave here uh, this uh, lecture introducing a beautiful uh, paper uh, a very exciting one by Black and Welsh from 1993, showing that uh, in uh, 16,000 people, I cannot even call them patients, who died from trauma, they did not die from cancer or any other angiogenesis-related disease that I will mention today, 39% of uh, uh, breast samples, uh, histological samples, 39% of the, of the people, uh, the women at the ages of 40 to 50, had these dormant lesions, meaning that they were about one millimeter, cubic millimeter in size, avascular, without uh, having blood vessels in their breast. In the men, amongst the men at the ages of 60 to 70, 46% of them had these prostate dormant lesions that did not proliferate and, and became uh, large tumors, but they were there very silent, and about 99.9% .9 of all the study, all 16,000 people in this Swedish uh, study had thyroid carcinoma, carcinoma in situ. So this is especially amazing and striking when you look at the numbers that are diagnosed clinically. And when we look at this range, only 1% of the women at this age range are diagnosed with breast cancer, 1% of the men with prostate cancer, and 0.1% are diagnosed with thyroid carcinoma. So obviously the, we can, sorry? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the ones that are, did not look in the study are diagnosed actually. So this can be very bothering but, and, and depressing, but on the other hand, we can look at it as, They were busy. <laughs> These were the ages of the people, the 16,000 people that were studied. But uh, we get, got some of the slides uh, from uh, the histological slides from these people, and we looked uh, at them and stained them for blood vessels. And obviously, most of these dormant tumors did not have any blood vessels or had impaired angiogenesis, impaired uh, vasculature that could not supply these tiny little lesions with oxygen and nutrients that they required in order to proliferate in mass and metastasize and progress. So if we look at the uh, angiogenic cascade, and here I'll go back and remember what we are all about here, about talking to each other from the different disciplines, angiogenesis is the uh, formation of new blood vessels from pre-existing ones. So if we have here a tumor mass that starts as a, a cluster of tumor cells, as this dormant lesions at one cubic millimeter in size, they start uh, uh, secreting, basically, angiogenic factors, those factors that cause the endothelial cells, the cells that line the vessel, the blood vessels, the existing blood vessels, and cause them to proliferate and migrate as chemoattractants towards the tumor cells and start forming this capillary-like 
vessels that can supply them with oxygen and nutrients that they demand in order to grow in mass. So we look at these different steps of the angiogenic cascade and we try to block them, meaning that if we can starve these lesions from the, all this blood supply, if we cut the blood supplies to, to them, we can probably starve them to death. So we, we try to do that by using nanoscale polymer therapeutics that are polymers, like this PEG, polyethylene glycol from yesterday, and some others that are degradable and different polymers that I will mention in a minute, then bind to them uh, chemotherapeutic agents and anti-angiogenic agents and some fluorophores and some other neat things in order to detect these early lesions and release them specifically and selectively in the tumor site and only there kill the, this tumor blood vessels without touching the normal organs or the normal uh, healthy vasculature in, in the adult. So this is all about a balance between the pro-angiogenic factors, those factors that promote the angiogenesis uh, cascade, and those that are the anti-angiogenic factors. The tumor cells secrete both pro-angiogenic and anti-angiogenic factors, and there is a balance. And as long as we have this balance, we remain this, with these tiny little lesions. The problem comes when the balance is dysregulated and towards the pro-angiogenic factors and the tumor mass starts to grow, and once we have the blood vessels, tumor cells can intravasate, not only extravasate from the blood vessel, but intravasate back to the vasculature, to the circulation, get out and extravasate in a different niche, and start forming their metastatic, metastatic site. So what we did in the lab using uh, molecular imaging techniques, non-invasive intravital molecular te imaging techniques, is that we form some pairs of dormant and aggressive uh, tumor cell lines that originate from the same parental cell line. That means that if we buy this uh, cell line of osteosarcoma, for example, and giving this as an example, we did it with prostate cancer, with breast cancer, and some other types of cancers, but this osteosarcoma, when you buy it from the ATCC, the Tissue Culture Bank in, in the U.S., you get a vial that uh, it says on the sheet uh, on it that uh, they do not take. Do not take, that means that if you take these cells, grow them in culture, inject them into, into mice, they will, not make a, they will not form a tumor. But they were not patient enough. We waited about a year, and after a year, this tumor started to grow in mass very quickly, and once they start growing, within a month, more or less, they kill the mouse. And these are human osteosarcoma cells that were originated from human samples. So we took these cells now, the, this tissue, tumor tissue, went back to the tissue culture, made a cell line, back to the mouse, injected, and now this time it formed the tumor that within one month get to this size that kills the mouse. So now we have two different cell lines, a dormant one that it takes about a year, and you have to remember that the lifetime of a mouse is about two to three years. So we're talking about almost all his life. If you go back to this 16,000 uh, people uh, study, so they would probably live and without even knowing that they have cancer until uh, they are detected very late at li uh, in life or not at all. So this is one year. And we have this one month uh, lifetime of a tumor that can grow in, a, in this mouth. So we took these two, and this very different profile in vivo is not correlated in vitro, meaning that if we take these two cell lines and grow them in vitro, in the lab, in the tissue culture, they have similar growth curves. They migrate at the same way. Well, that means that if we look at the angiogenic cascade that I mentioned before, they need the, endothel the tumor cells need to migrate towards an, uh, an chemoattractant, something that is chemically calling them to continue to proliferate and migrate and move, and this is the way they metastasize as well. So they have the same proliferation and the same migration rate. But if we take the condition media, that is the media where they live in, and we put it on endothelial cells, meaning we take the media where the tumor cells grow, this is imitating the microenvironment like we have in vivo in the mouse. We take them and put now uh, this condition media on the endothelial cells, we see a very different picture. So this is imitating the clinical setting of disease where we need the microenvironment to support the growth of these uh, cells. 
So if we look at how all this correlates to this nano-scaled polymer therapeutics, we would like to uh, take these different polymeric architectures, and I will mention in a minute which ones they are, and hang on them some anti-angiogenic agents, some chemotherapeutic agents. We know today that we cannot treat cancer with monotherapy. We're, we're much more realistic today. We don't expect that uh, we can cure the disease and treat it as one disease. We're talking about 240 different cancers at least, and we will not cure them with one single drug. Each one is very different from the other, and each one has different cells. It's a very heterogenic tissue that we cannot treat all the cells in one tumor type as a similar. So we will need different uh, combinations of different drugs. And we also have the ability to add a detection moiety, a fluorescent detection moiety, where we can see both detect the, the primary tumor and the metastatic site, the metastatic uh, lesions, early enough in, in time, so it has to be very sensitive. And also we would like it to report at real time about the drug release from the polymer. So it's not enough that we have the polymer reaching the tumor site. We would like to see that it released the drug and the drug actually got only to the tumor site and not to healthy uh, organs. So we would like to take this... Uh, probably usually you detect later time this uh, tissue mass that is already angiogenic and reverse it to the dormant phenotype, which is a phenotype that we can live with for the long, as long as we live. So if we look at the differences between the, the vasculature of normal tissues and, uh, and tumor tissues, you can see here very clearly we injected this polymer therapeutics that I just showed you, a polymer that has uh, drugs hanged on it, and a fluorescent tag, in this case it is a fluorescein isotiocyanate, FITI, and you can see that here, this is a normal tissue, we have anastomosis, anastomosis is the functional loop that allows for the circulation to continue, and when you look just one millimeter aside, this is at the same scale, the tumor vasculature, they are large, there is a sluggish flow, there are some blunt ends. We don't have this anastomosis that's connecting vessels, and it gets stuck and goes back and forth. The other thing that we can see is that these macromolecular polymers can leak only from these leaky vessels, tumor vessels, but and this is why you see in the background all this fluorescent uh, labeling, and you see here in the normal tissue black, very clean background because they cannot extravasate from normal vasculature but only from this leaky vasculature in the tumor. So we get passive uh, accumulation in the tumor just by virtue of their um, mechanics, of their configuration and their size. And uh, we can also uh, get the advantage of solubilization of insoluble drugs. Many of the chemotherapeutic drugs, such as paclitaxel, the taxol family that is uh, commonly used, and TNP-470, which is an uh, angiogenesis inhibitor, are, are poorly soluble, and they require solubilizer agents, solubilizing agents, that on their own are toxic and cause hypersensitive effects. So in order to avoid that, we use inert polymers that will solubilize these uh, poorly soluble drugs and allow them to accumulate selectively in the, tissue, in the tumor tissue. That uh, will allow us to have uh, some reduced toxicity, will avert from drug resistance, extend the half-life of the drug, and we get both drugs, at least two, and sometimes we try even three, uh, drugs released at the same time at the tumor at the same site, and we can get synergistic effect of uh, the two drugs. That means that each one of the drugs have its own uh, anti-tumor effect, but together they sum more than two. And I will go back to it in a minute. So we have these polymers. Because what I showed you before, the, the large molecules cannot leak from the tightly regulated uh, endothelial cells that line the blood vessels. They cannot get out. And when we have the tumor blood vessels, they are very leaky. We have VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, which is one of the m most secreted factors from tumor tissues that originally was called a permeability factor. And it causes this permeable uh, between the junctions of the, between the endothelial cells and allow these macromolecules to leak out where they cannot leak normal vessels. 
all tumors are angiogenesis dependent. And these angiogenic blood vessels, because they have to form very quickly, they, as you saw, form uh, defectively. So they, they are formed very quickly. VEGF causes this hyperpermeability, but also uh, because, uh, induce the proliferation and the survival of endothelial cells. So it, on one hand, it causes them to make blood vessels, but they are not made properly. They're made good enough in order to get blood and allowing oxygen and nutrients and everything the, to get into the tissue, but there is a flood of molecules. There is no per, um, selectivity of what gets out. Okay? So we played with different polymers and different drugs and different detection moieties, and, the, the, and we have some targeting moieties that we can use uh, that will not... Uh, rely on only on the passive accumulation of these macromolecules, but also on active targeting, meaning that we, and this uh, Dina Poliak showed in on her poster yesterday, that we can use some markers, some receptors that are overexpressed on tumor cells, but then it's very local to certain, uh, selective to the different tumor cells, or to tumor endothelial cells, which are much more universal because all tumors are angiogenesis dependent. So they are ex overexpressed on tumor endothelial cells, but not on normal, endothelial cell, normal healthy endothelial cells. So we can use this uh, overexpressed receptor while uh, binding to these polymers a certain uh, peptide or a certain ligand that will bind selectively to this overexpressed uh, receptor or reintegrin. And uh, this is a process that is much faster than only the passive uh, accumulation of these macromolecules. So, as I told you, we played with different polymers. Uh, some of them, like the PEG, the polyethylene glycol, or HPMA, the hydroxypropyl metacryl amide copolymer, are non-degradable. Other, like uh, polyglutamic acid or uh, um, the polyglycerol amide dendrimers, are uh, degradable in the body, so we know that they are degradable to uh, non-toxic, small mole uh, molecular weight uh, uh, structures such as uh, glycerol, and that are secreted from the body at the end by renal secretion. We find them in the urine, and we know that whatever was not accumulated in the tumor tissue was just excreted outside of the body. So they vary in their multivalency, meaning that if we have a polymer if it's multivalent, we can hang on it several things. Or like PEG, which is not a multivalent, it's one chain that we can just bind at each end group, one, for example, ligand and one, uh, or one targeting moiety and one molecule of a drug. So the drug loading is much lower in this kind of polymers as opposed to polyglutamic acid or, or HPMA that we have many sites that we can about 10 to 20 mole percent of the uh, polymers, meaning out of 100 monomers, at least 20 are functional and we can uh, bind to them different uh, drugs or the same drug at high loading. Uh, they vary in their linkers as well. We can use linkers between the polymer and the drug that are either uh, pH sensitive. We know that at the tumor site the pH is lower than in other uh, normal tissues and it goes uh, as when the, the whole complex, the, the whole conjugate, is uh, endocytosing inside to the cell, we get a lowering the pH, meaning that in the endosome we have pH 6.5 and the lysosome, lysosome we have pH 5.5 and we can control the release of the drug uh, or the biological component. I'll talk a little bit about siRNA and microRNA that we're delivering in specific organelles inside the, the cell. The other option is to have an enzymatically cleavable linker, meaning that we look into enzymes that are overexpressed in tumor endothelial cells or in tumor cells and get a sequence, uh, synthesize a peptide syn uh, sequence like the glyphylugly or the phenylalanine lysine that Dina talked about yesterday that are uh, cleaved by catepsin B, which is an enzyme, metalloprotease uh, uh, enzyme that is overexpressed in the lysosome of tumors, many tumor cells and uh, all tumor endothelial cells. We can use a gly gly pro NLE, or leucine, a peptide that is cleaved by catepsin K. This is another enzyme that is overexpressed in a, a bone resorption site, meaning that if we look at uh, osteosarcoma, the same model of a dormant and aggressive uh, pair that we made, or uh, for prostate cancer and breast cancer, the, 
we don't know why it is a, a, a large uh, issue. Uh, I think there are a lot of labs that are investigating uh, why they go specifically to bones, but once we see these metastatic lesions in the bones, it's usually too late and too aggressive and uh, resistant to m most chemotherapies already. So this allows us to have a linker that will degrade only at si bone resorption sites, meaning in, on those tumors where, that are sited in the bone. We can also use different targeting moieties like alendronate, a bisphosphonate, which is given usually to osteoporosis, to women in their menopause. And this uh, family of uh, bisphosphonates in general, this is uh, an amino bisphosphonate, will target selectively uh, the hydroxyapatite, the bone mineral. Uh, so we get a selective and active accumulation in the bone, and then they're released due to the catepsin K cleavage and release of the drug selectively in these tumor sites. So it will not go only to it will not go to all the bones, but rather only the bones that have tumors in them. So these are just examples of, of the different games that we can do. And the way we select for our drugs, the combination of drugs, is that we'll take drugs that have different mechanism of action, different mechanism of uh, resistance, different mechanism toxicity profiles, uh, some that have anti-angiogenic effect or anti-tumor potency. And basically we test them prior to putting them on the binding them to the polymer, we test them in tissue culture to see that they have synergistic effect and not only additive or, God forbid, antagonistic effect, that they cancel each other's effect, which happens very common as well. So the three different architectures that I will show you today are this uh, linear or hyperbranched po polymers or copolymers that, uh, like the HPMA, the hydroxypropyl metacrylamide, or the PGA, the polyglutamic acid. We'll show you some that are based on polyethylene glycol that is not multivalent, but we added a forearm beta-glutamic acid here that allows for higher loading of the drug, meaning that we can put four alendronate, this, this phosphonate that I just mentioned that accumulates selectively in, in bone tissue, on one side, and on the other side, on the other end of the peg, we'll put a paclitaxel, for example, or a different hydrophobic uh, molecule, uh, a chemotherapeutic drug, and what we get is a self-assembled micelle here that in the center, in the core, we have an hydrophobic core of a drug that is insoluble, and outside uh, the amino bisphosphonate, the alendronate, which has a, has a lot of uh, hydroxyls and is highly soluble in water, and we get this disassembled on this structure being disassembled only at low pH on, in the tumor. The third one is not a covalent linking, but rather an entrapment of siRNA or microRNA, for those of you that are not uh, familiar with the term. Uh, microRNA are uh, small RNA sequences, about 22 uh, nucleotides that uh, bind to complementary messenger RNA in the cytoplasm. I see some glazed looks already. And <laughs> what basically it does is that it uh, silences a gene of interest or that it uh, inhibits, suppresses the expression of the, the protein that they code to. Was that clear? Okay. So we, we can target them with different dendrimers, and in this case we use polyglycerol dendrimers that are inert and water-soluble as opposed to most of the dendrimers that are commonly used, such as a pamantrin, a polyamidoamine dendrimers. That, what is a dendrimer? Okay, thank you. I urge you to ask me questions, please. So a dendrimer is a tree-like molecule, a very, and if we compare, it's a polymer as well, but if we can compare this to these different uh, hyperbranched polymers, they are perfect molecules, meaning that if we look at a polymer, a hyperbranch, we can have a, like a bell shape of different molecular weight fractions, different sizes of molecular weight. They are not perfect. They are not single, very well characterized molecule, and I... Uh, very familiar with the, these horrible NMR uh, pictures of proteins, similar to proteins. These are the pictures that we we'll get from polymers when we do mass spec or NMR, as opposed to these uh, perfect molecules, the dendrimers, that are uh, very well defined. They have one single peak that are, is one molecular weight. Their polydispersity is basically one. Polydispersity of polymers is the molecular weight divided by the molecular number. So we don't have all, all the molecules have the same molecular weight, so it's very, and it, they are sphere-like molecules, so they grow exponentially, one, two, four, eight, to all size and, and form a sphere as opposed to this 
spaghetti coils that have their advantages. They will probably penetrate better uh, to the different heterogeneous uh, sites of the tissue, of the tumor tissue, because they can uh, enter, uh, penetrate much better than these spherical, uh, very perfect molecules that cannot internalize into the different permeability sites of the vasculature. This is in a nutshell. So we, we can take, uh, we can bind this paclitaxel or the different uh, TNP-470, the different drugs that are uh, insoluble, add alendronate as the targeting moiety, which also has antiangiogenic effect. They both together are synergistic. We tested it in, in the form of a hyperbranch polymer or in the form of a self-assembled micelle. They will bind to the hydroxyapatite in the bone via the alendronate, this uh, amino bisphosphonate, and there they will meet catepsin B or catepsin K, the different enzymes that I mentioned, for example, that are overexpressed in this tissue, the linker will be cleaved and the drugs will be released locally only in the places where these uh, enzymes are over, overexpressed. Uh, as opposed to the micelle that will degrade upon hydrolysis, just at the lower pH or the presence of water. So the first step is to see, just not on the polymer, just taking two drugs, and I won't go over this, this is a lot of uh, um, calculations behind it and different ratios and optimizations between the two drugs, but you have to find the ratio that you want to put these different drugs on the polymer, polymeric chain, and you find the ratio that uh, they are synergistic, the concentrations that are synergistic. So you, buy, you construct this isobologram, meaning that if the... Uh, uh, inhibitory concentration that you get in the combination index is to the left of the, this line between the two drugs. Here is alendronate, here is TNP-470. It means that it, they are synergistic. If it is on the line, it means that they are additive. And on the right, if it goes to the right, that means they are antagonistic. And obviously, you will not dis use this combination of drugs because they cancel each other's effect. So we chose this. The, the conjugates that I'll show you have the drugs on them that uh, form a, a synergistic effect. In this case, I will show you the HPMA copolymer that has a glyglypro NLE tetrapeptide linker that is cleaved by catepsin K, this enzyme that is overexpressed in bone uh, uh, neoplasms, as bound in alendronate, a TNP-470, which is the antiangiogenic, and a FITSI molecule, a fluorescein molecule for detection. The other one is a paclitaxel, the taxol is bound, and here we have a tetrapeptide and the D-peptide, phenylalanine lysine, having a PABC, para-amino carbonate uh, uh, linker, that by 1,6 elimination will get back the release of the free paclitaxel as it is in, in the origin. So we get, while, while the drug is conjugated to the polymer, it is inert, it has no activity, and only when it is released as the original drug, then we get its uh, activity back. So the, the difference between the different polymers that I showed you, although it is the same polymer that is formed, the HPMA copolymer, this is by regular thermopolymerization, while the previous one was done by reversible addition fragmentation chain transfer. This is leaving polymerization, which allows us to get a much more control dispersity. So in this case, the polydispersity that we achieved was a 1.05, which is almost perfect for, for a polymer, as opposed to 1.6 that we get from the thermopolymerization uh, and the bioconjugation, meaning that in the first case, we had a monomer that we bound to it the drugs. To each monomer, we bound the drug, and then we did the polymerization in living polymerization. In this case, we have the polymeric precursor and then we bind the drugs to, to the precursor. Uh, the, the third uh, structure that I showed you are these self-assembled micelles that, again, we have four molecules of alendronate, meaning that uh, due to this dendron at the end of polyethylene glycol, we allowed for a higher loading of the uh, water-soluble drug and one uh, molecule of uh, paclitaxel, but it... It forms the micelle that we have a high loading of the paclitaxel inside the hydrophobic core. Uh, the third uh, actively targeted structure, I will not go into it because Dina uh, spoke about it yesterday, is having a 
uh, integrin uh, binding peptide. It is the cyclic RGD sequence that will bind selectively to these integrins that are overexpressed on tumor endothelial cells, delivering doxorubicin or paclitaxel, different chemotherapeutic drugs. So now we, we, it's not enough that we know that they are synergistic. We want to know that they are actually, that they actually get, got to the tumor and what we did if the first polymer that I showed you had FITSI hanged on the polymer, but this only when we inject it intravenously into the mouse, what we get is the location of the polymer conjugate. It doesn't say anything about the release of the drugs from the polymer. So what we did in collaboration with Don Shabbat's group is we formed a new structure that has a turn-on, turn-off uh, fluorescent labeling, meaning, and this is the model, the first model, the uh, continuation is, of this project is done by Leora Omer in the audience, where she hangs it on the, on the polymer and having a macromolecule with the advantage of real-time reporting of the drug release, meaning that we have a trigger that is cleaved by either a specific enzyme that is overexpressed, similar to the linker that we had between the drug and the polymer, or we have a trigger that is cleaved by the low pH uh, that is uh, unique to the uh, tumor tissue. And once it is cleaved, we have the same 1,6 elimination process that we saw for the PABC release of the paclitaxel. Yes? Okay. And uh, we, we get a, rep a report of the drug release, meaning that once the, re the drug is released, we get, in this case, hydroxycumarin, that is the fluorescence that uh, turns on, and we can see it in the... Mouse. So you can see it clearly here in, the, in vitro that once we add the enzyme into the solution of this uh, uh, conjugate, it becomes immediately fluorescence, in this case reporting on the, on the drug release. We did it with melphalan and with a catepsin B cleavable linker, and now we're doing it uh, with Leora with different, uh, different drugs and different uh, linkers. So in, in order to go systematically about the a design from a, the synthesis of a polymer conjugate until the, it's testing in vivo on the mouse, we have to pass the chemical characterization, the in vitro anti-tumor and anti-angiogenic activity, and in vivo to look that it is not toxic, as we hypothesized, and that it, is a, it retained its activity or de definitely became safer and more effective in vivo. So I'll go over the characterization very quickly. We can uh, determine its molecular weight, and this is what I mentioned about uh, this kind of polymers to reach a polydispersity of 1.05 is, is a real achievement. I never believed that I will see such a narrow uh, polydispersity for a hyperbranch polymer, so um, uh, I became a great groupie of uh, the living polymerization technique. Um, we see that once we bind the alendronate, the bisphosphonate, to the polymer, we didn't lose its activity. It still uh, binds to the hydroxyhepatite powder, the, the bone mineral. Uh, we look in, in cells now by confocal microscopy, and we see that it, it internalized. The green is the conjugate with the FITSI. So we see that it internalized in the z stack here. You can see that it, it is inside the cell. Blue is DAPI is for the nucleus, and red for phalloidin for the actin filaments, uh, the cytoskeleton of the cell. And you can see that it really internalizes into uh, the cell. In this case, we tested on UVEC, on endothelial, human umbilical vein endothelial cells that we isolate from umbilical cords that we get from the hospital following delivery of babies, or on the osteosarcoma. So they internalize both into endothelial cells and into tumor cells and we want to see if they are active. It's not enough that they get there. They need to release the drugs and show the, the, that they retain their activity following the cleavage. And we can see that the free drugs and the drugs that are conjugated on the polymer are, have the same uh, anti-proliferative uh, toxicity profile to the tumor cells, the target cells. We see that it is dependent on the release of catepsin K. Catepsin K is not the only uh, enzyme that is active here, so we get just partial uh, reconstitution of the uh, inhibition of uh, proliferation of growth. But if we add a uh, catepsin B inhibitor, this would move completely to, to the right. So we test its migration, and migration, we do in vitro a migration assay while putting a monolayer of the cells, the endothelial cells, on this insert, on a membrane. We put at the bottom media that have chemoattractants that cause the cells to move to the other side, and then we see that the free drugs and the conjugate have the same uh, anti-migrative uh, 
um, activities. So we see that all the angiogenic cascade that we discussed, it inhibits the proliferation, the migration, and also if we put endothelial cells on matrigel, on the extracellular matrix, they start within, uh, in this case, nine hours, we see that they form this vascular network without adding anything else to the, uh, to the media here. And if we do it the same experiment in the presence of the conjugate, you see that they try to form this vascular network. They are still alive. We're not killing them, but they are not able to migrate. So it means that they will not be able to form these capillary-like tubular structures. So even if we get endothelial cells, there will be clusters of cells without forming these networks, meaning that they will not be functional as blood vessels. So we can quantitate it. And finally, when we go to the toxicity evaluation, we see that uh, we get inhibition of a uh, white blood cell, decrease in white blood cell count by the free uh, drugs compared to the conjugate. We get body, body weight decrease when we treat with the free drugs, but we don't get it with the conjugate. And uh, finally, when we do the anti-tumor activity, we can see that we, this, they survive for the whole term of the study while the free drugs treated mice, they do not survive. And the most important thing is that we could regress their uh, phenotype to the dormant phenotype while using a, an equivalent concentration to that of the free drugs. This basically summarizes all that I spoke about because you can see that by changing the pharmacokinetic of the drugs, you can completely change at the similar concentration by the fact that it reaches the tumor together and simultaneously being released, you can get them to be much more active and regress to the uh, dormant phenotype, a phenotype that we can live uh, for the rest of our lives. So the, the final slide that I'll show you is that we took a, a microRNA that was detected, one out of many, and here are a list of different microRNAs, that we delivered to the in vivo to the cells, to the tumor tissue, and we did it with these dendrimers that I mentioned in the beginning, and what we can see is that now this microRNA, by a single microRNA that is delivered selectively to the tumor, we're regressing the aggressive phenotype to the dormant phenotype for, again, for 100 days, that is at least a third of the life of the mouse. So I'll leave you with this uh, schematic summary where we know now that, of course, we, dormant tumors can become angiogenic and fast-growing, but we can use this polymer, uh, nanoscale polymer therapeutics to get them back to dormancy phenotype. I would like to thank the excellent lab members and the really wonderful collaborators and, of course, the financial support. Thank you. So this sounds like a, 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 a wonderful, perfect uh, approach to tackle, uh, um, to tackle cancer. But what, what would you say, and, and there are different challenges you pointed out, what would you say is the biggest obstacle to solve until getting this into patients? Is there one or are all the... I think the biggest obstacle when we talk about polymers is their characterization. Uh, it, it's very difficult to get these narrowly dispersed uh, and, and very clean uh, molecules. All pharmaceutical companies want small molecules, very clear cut, that they know how to uh, characterize, they know what they have in hand. And this is why we made so, we're making still so much effort in uh, making this, synthesizing these polymers in a way that it will be much easier to uh, characterize them and uh, to have a defined product at the end and not a, a combination of different uh, structures. But also we need to make sure that either it is a degradable polymer or a polymer that is large enough to be able to extravasate from these leaky vessels but small enough to be excreted from the renal threshold. So not to, to become this plastic man that uh, we're full with, with all these polymers without getting rid of them. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.